Good morning. I have the honor of being joined by Senior Reporter Patrick Wall. Patrick, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Yes, thank you for having me. So Patrick, one of the things that really excited me about uh, a bit of your history was the fact that you were first an educator before embarking on your journey as a journalist. I would love to know a bit uh, about that transition for you because um, I love the fact that you are willing to not only ask and find answers to hard questions, you're willing to sit with me to answer some of the, the difficult questions faced by our communities as well. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I do, there, I would say there are some some overlap between what teachers do and what journalists, you know, in terms of um, trying to, first of all, be an expert on the issues that you're talking about, whether you're teaching or writing, and then also trying to communicate them in, in a clear way that engages people. Um, and then specifically, it's also, it was helpful for me as a, a journalist because I cover education. And so knowing a little, just a little bit about like, like what it actually is like in the classroom has been very helpful for me. Indeed, indeed. And today, uh, you know, you and I just happened upon this uh, question, you know, around misinformation. And, and uh, you know, I've been realizing as, a, as someone who is practicing in the mental health field, it has become a bit of a concern in that field as well, because we ask ourselves how much is misinformation sort of shifting us away from common ground with each other. So I just wanted to ask you, what is misinformation and is it problematic? Yes, um, well, you know, and first I wanna say I, this is such a timely issue. So I am glad that we're talking about it right now. Um, so just at a very basic level, misinformation is just false information that is spread. And so, you know, some common examples would be like rumors or conspiracy theories. Um, and then you, this might begin a little technical, but there's another kind of branch of this is disinformation. And that is where it's false information that is intentionally um, false and intentionally spread. So people know it is, it is not true, but they still spread it. Um, whereas with misinformation, people might not know that it's false. So with disinformation, you might think about propaganda where governments are trying to influence people with false information. Um, or a new thing that we see on the internet is manipulated photos or deep fake videos, they call them, where it's like they can actually make it look like someone said or did something in a video that they didn't actually do. So it's getting it's getting all the more sophisticated because of technology. So that makes it much more of a problem. And then I think you know why this is so is getting so bad is because social media has made it so easy. First of all, to be exposed to misinformation yeah. because so much is coming at you, all different sources. It can be really hard to tell them apart and distinguish what's true or what's not. And then also, it's so easy to spread disinformation. Someone sees something. It's incorrect, but it gets them excited or gets them angry, and then they want to spread it with other to other people, let them know about it, and that's how they become viral and, and reach so many people. Um, and something I was uh, I was doing some research, and um, BuzzFeed News had done an analysis of the 2016 election, and they found that on Facebook, um, fake news or like false stories got way more interactions, shares, and likes and stuff than all the top uh, news stories by actual news organizations uh, during the election. So people, at least on Facebook, had more exposure to false information than, than real information. Um, so, I, so I think that makes it more problematic is how easy this is spread. And then the last thing I would say is that um, it's such an important skill to be able to distinguish between false or mm -hmm. real information, but that isn't something people just know. Uh, you have to learn it and be taught it. And I do think, you know, some teachers are great at, at making that a part of what they do, but mm. I think schools could get better at really explicitly teaching students how to distinguish this, how to judge the credibility of a source um, and, and know when they're being fed misinformation. Because like I said, it's coming at people all the time and students yes. are supposed to do it. You know, you, you that's so such a valid point. And I think what 
um, jumped out at me was, you know, basically what causes are two things. What causes us to sort of gravitate to the negative information and spread it a lot faster than we would the positive information? And the second question was, I recall learning about critical thinking or, or research writing for studying for research at a master's level, right? So your point to starting a lot sooner is so relevant because not many people may want to even pursue a master's uh, degree to learn how to shift through uh, research information. So could you just speak to us about those two things and observation of observing how quickly negative news spreads and how yeah. we, you know, implement critical thinking? Well, just on your second point first about why this is so important and why people need to be taught this more is that, you know, if you think about the past, the sources of information that people might see would be like a newspaper, uh, what's on television on a major news network, and then like books per se or magazines. Um, all of those are kind of professional vetted information. So people could pretty much just assume that what they're seeing is accurate. Whereas now on the internet, it can come from anyone or anywhere, you know, anyone can tweet or put stuff on Facebook. And so people just, it's just so much easier to be, come across misinformation. So I do think that makes it much more important to know how to distinguish that. It just wasn't a skill people needed as much in the past. Um, so to that, and then as far as why, um, you know, why this spreads, I do think there's some, re and, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I do think there is some research that stuff that like negatively incites people um, is actually more of a motivating factor sometimes than kind of positive motivation. Um, and I also have seen some research too that that information that confirms things that you already believe yes. is stuff that you are prone to latch onto. So that's why conspiracy theories are something that a lot of people pick up on, especially like political ones, because yeah. it confirms what they want to believe, which obviously we're seeing right now with the election. People who wanted Donald Trump to win are very prone to believing conspiracy theories that their election was rigged and he actually did win. Yes, yes, which, you know, leads us into, you know, the third question, which is um, to pick, piggyback off your discussion on critical thinking, which is crucial. Um, there are times when, you know, having a sort of, uh, sort of, sort of uh, going with your gut that something doesn't seem right and researching that like like edward snowden did you know he sort of had a a feeling that that the um u.s intelligence officials had a massive uh wiretapping conspiracy so there are times when this is very helpful um and sometimes rich and powerful people are plotting things so how do we sort of differentiate um, and take responsibility because I think to your point on um, the confirmation bias, I think part of that is a, like a drive to blame someone else, but how can we take responsibility for holding our authorities, uh, um, you know, sort of getting them to, to be accountable to us rather than just distrusting them altogether? Mm. No, I, I think that's a great question. And it's something that I think about a lot as a journalist, because, you know, part of what we want to do is be skeptical without being totally cynical and not believing anything. And I think that's a good thing for people in the public, too. Um, but, you know, just first, to your point about institutions, um, officials misleading the public, I mean, there is a long history of that, you know, just at all across the world, but, you know, in, including the United States going back to Vietnam War, you know, covering up some of the military actions, um, the reasons that we invaded the Iraq War, some of that was based on false information. Um, if you think recently at the local level about um, in Flint, Michigan, the, the city officials there covered up the contamination of water. Um, and then people, I think, are probably, you know, have heard a lot of instances of, uh, for example, police officers, other types of officials falsifying, you know, records and things that happen. So, so that's just to say that it isn't like being paranoid if people do have some skepticism about what officials say. But like I said, I do think that it is a balance between being skeptical and being cynical, which just means not believing anything that anyone says. And that's not good either, because, you know, mostly what people, what officials say usually is, 
is accurate, but there, you know, there are times when it's not. So what I would say is, first of all, you know, if you can um, try to see if there's a way to verify what people are saying, like if an official says something, you know, can you Google and see are there news outlets that have reported that or is there data that backs it up? And then the, you know, the second thing, this is kind of maybe, you know, as a journalist, I would say this, but, you know, this is kind of the role of journalists. And so I would say, you know, you know, average citizens who have their own lives to go about can't vet every information that that officials say. So you, you do kind of have to rely on journalists, like to a degree that is what we kind of are, are paid and trained to do. And so, um, you know, I, I was just thinking about examples, you know, this is something, like I said, that we try to do. So, um, you know, for example, here in Newark, I cover education. And um, this spring, you know, I went, schools just went remote. Um, there was a lot, you know, it was a hard, it was new to everyone. It was kind of chaotic. A lot of students weren't showing up to remote learning. I heard that from a lot of teachers, but then when I got the, the public records, the district was reporting uh, like a 99% attendance rate, which based on all my reporting, I just knew that wasn't accurate. And so then I had to kind of report, talk to teachers, find out what had caused that. It turned out there was a state policy that let the district report it, that students were present unless they had proof that they weren't, which kind of led to these inaccurate numbers. So anyways, if I had just taken at face value this, this number that was in these official documents, it would have been wrong. So I had to kind of vet that information. And so that's not something an average citizen could probably do for everything, but hopefully journalists at you know legitimate organizations can help with that. Sure, sure, agreed. Agreed. And, uh, you know, as you were talking about critical thinking, it just I just realized that uh, one of the programs, one of the lessons we teach in our Resilient Stars program is critical thinking to help kids brainstorm and weigh the pros and cons of, of situations. So I'm, I'm glad that we're on to something, we're on to something. Um, in terms of the last question, we had a uh, some research here by uh, social psychologist Roland Imhoff, and he's saying that if we could, tr if we, if I trust the scientist and you trust the person on YouTube, we don't have common ground, so we become very polarized. I might say I don't want to even speak to you again, and you might say likewise, right? And uh, so if we, if we find ourselves sort of moving away from each other and, and really starting to even hate each other based on our views. What does that mean for us as a society, you think? Yeah, I mean, it definitely is the case. Um, I think there is some research to show that we have, as a country, become more polarized, um, especially on political, um, on, on areas about politics. I mean, to be fair, we've been polarized before thinking about the Civil War, so it hasn't, that has been totally new, but right. there, I think there has been some research that it's gotten worse. And one thing I think that happens is that people um, associate someone's beliefs with their entire person. So if they have a belief that they disagree with and they kind of see that whole person as someone that they you know, are against and can't support. So I think that's one thing we can try to do is just separate someone's viewpoints that we might disagree with from them as a person. And like, you know, you might not agree with them on their policy views, but there are other things that, that probably can agree on. Um, and then I think the other thing is just, again, trying to find legitimate information, valid sources of information, like nonpartisan news outlets, um, because that hopefully is stuff that is just basic facts that, that can be kind of a common ground for us. It, you know, that doesn't always work out that way. We've seen even with the coronavirus that people have politicized that and that, that information that scientists have said is just accurate about how it spreads, about the importance of masks and social distancing. Some people are actually denying that and, and that's become a political issue. So it doesn't always happen, but I think if we try to focus on verifiable facts, that's one way to find common ground. Excellent. Just one more question. Do you have uh, examples of a few nonpartisan uh, news outlets that you know you would you would go to just yourself that you would trust? Mm hmm. I mean, I kind of often lean towards more traditional 
news outlets because that's kind of in line with what I do. So, you know, at a national level, like the big newspapers, like the Washington Post and New York Times, um, TV news that I know a lot of people, some people prefer like CNN, um, you know, there are more partisan news networks like Fox News or MSNBC that so I think you want to be careful when you watch those to know that they have a particular perspective. Mm -hmm. And then at the local level, you know, there's a lot of great sources in New Jersey NJ.com, um, uh, NJ Spotlight News has more about the issues. Um, and then Chalkbeat, where I work, we just focus on education. So one, so in this kind of gets in actually to um, something I think that you also were kind of um, wanting to, to hear a little bit about is how you, how you kind of assess different news sources. Mm -hmm. um, and so just a few things on that, you know, one, you can look for just the about page. Like if you go to a website and you're not sure, like it looks like it might be real news, but you're not sure. If you go to the about page, you want to see like, do they tell who the owner is, how it's funded? Those are usually signs of a legitimate news source. And it's, um, and it, you know, I have to say it's, it's not always clear because there are some um, sites and like Facebook pages and things on the internet that are meant to look like real news outlets, but it's actually made up news. Wow. So you can't just assume because you saw it on a website that it's true. Um, same thing with like just resource, like if you go to Wikipedia, I think a lot of students assume like, well, that's just facts because it's like on the internet, but people can go in and edit those. And so you can't assume that's true. So even with like a website, you want to look, okay, what, where are they getting the information from? And then when you're reading a new story, like a traditional, like an actual news story usually has quotes um, from experts or people that have been interviewed. So if you're not seeing quotes or if you're seeing like things that um, they don't have names attached to them or they, um, the names look fake, like those are signs that that might not be a real story. Okay. And then another just basic thing is, is the article, is the thing that you're reading, is there an author attached to it? If it's, if it's a fake news thing or if it's like um, misinformation, it might just be a meme that just has words but no author or an article that is anonymous, mm -hmm. that's usually a sign it's not legitimate. Um, and then if it if you if it's okay for me to say a few more things about this um some of the questions that you might ask when you're look when you're trying to evaluate like is this misinformation or accurate you know you want to try to separate is it fact or opinion so is this something that could be proven or is this something that is someone's take or perspective about an issue so you're trying when you want you know straight information you're trying to look for facts like is this something that someone could prove mm -hmm. and then um how is it being presented is it being presented in a way that's kind of emotional or it's kind of an extreme way that's trying to have a perspective or is it just kind of straightforward like here's here's what you need to know that mm -hmm. that usually is more factual mm -hmm. um and then some sources that you might use to help you with this um there are fact checking websites. There's one like, for example, called PolitiFact that it'll, if it sees that there's misinformation that's spreading, it'll research it and, and tell the right information. So if you're not sure, you're like, oh, this sounds like it could be fake. You can check one of these fact checking websites. Um, there's something called NewsGuard and it's like a, um, a tool you can use. You can put it in your internet browser and it rates different news sources it has like a color coded rating. And so it'll tell you that they've researched different news outlets to see if they you can trust them or not. Okay. So that's a way to help you. Um, and then just getting back to where we started about news literacy, there are a lot of really good resources to teach people how to evaluate the news, different information. So there's something called the News Literacy Project. Um, the museum, which is a place in Washington, DC, also has an, a website that's really good. It has videos and things to learn. And so there's a lot of ways that um, if you just personally want to research it, you can, or educators, it has really great lesson plans and things like that and videos to show. So there are a lot of ways to kind of get better at evaluating the information that you come across. This has been awesome. I've taken a lot of notes. <laughs> And the link um, in our YouTube link below is Patrick. Thank you so much for your insights and sharing today. Very, very cool. helpful. Well, thank you for having me. It was great to talk to you. Likewise. <laughs> so.